with three passengers aboard. 23-year-old aviator Harold Bud Coffey flew the first plane into Yosemite Valley to explore the feasibility of a passenger air route. Coffey was piloting a new monoplane built in Berkeley by the Jacuzzi Brothers, famous today for their Whirlpool spas. On the July 14, 1921 return to the Bay Area, Coffey planned a quick drop into Modesto to see his girlfriend. Shortly after 8 a.m., residents of the sleepy central California town heard a plane buzzing overhead. As they watched it flying, they witnessed the horrifying sight of a wing cracking loose and the fuselage plummeting into a death spiral. On this episode of History Hunters, Jeff recounts the air disaster as he seeks out the crash site and the graves of the pilot and the jacuzzi brother killed in the crash. This is where the story actually begins. This is the Modesto Municipal Golf Course, but in 1921, it was the first airport. This is where Bud Coffey was intending to set down his plane from Yosemite that fateful day in the summer of 1921. Now this monument explains how the airport came to be in 1918, after land was donated for it. After the crash, just a few miles from here, this airfield right here was named Coffey Field. Most locals don't know that this was an airport at one time, and they especially don't know anything about the historic plane crash associated with it. As a daring hotshot military pilot in the dawning age of aviation, Bud Coffey was admired by men and women alike. His friendly demeanor and ready grin earned him the nickname of Smiling Bud. He's known for chomping on a cigar most of the time. Bud Coffey was born February 6, 1898 to the Coffey family of Modesto, where today a street is named for them. Lon Coffey, his father, was an insurance agent. Emmeline Wilson Coffey was a doting and loving mother. Bud grew up in Modesto and graduated from the grammar school in 1912. In 1917, he graduated from Oakland Technical School and attended aviation school in Berkeley. A Berkeley ground school graduate during the First World War, Coffey became an instructor in San Diego where he earned the rank of second lieutenant in the Army Air Service. It was here that Bud Coffey was trying to set down on July 14, 1921, as he flew in from this direction from Yosemite National Park. Kind of amazing to think that a hundred years ago, the airplanes would actually rev their engines up right approximately in this area and take off in that northwest direction. This was Modesto's first airport. It was a city-county airport, and in 1918 it opened as such. It was the first type of its facility in the United States. And in the 1930s, the city of Modesto decided that they needed a different facility, so they built the present-day Modesto airport. Once they decided to take this airport out of commission, it became a golf course in about 1933. The trees actually align themselves with how the airplanes used to take off into that prevailing wind, that northwest direction there. They would rise up at the far end of the airport there and they would be in the sky by the time they reached Tuolumne Boulevard down there and rise up over the Modesto High School football field. An accomplished and confident pilot, Bud Coffey claimed a number of aviation firsts after the war, he engaged in commercial aviation, making the first flight into Stockton with passengers. The first flight into Hetch Hetchy and the first at the Feather River Inn at Lake Tahoe. Coffee was well acquainted with a Modesto airstrip where he maintained a hangar. In 1921, the Jacuzzis have a bright future as fledgling airplane manufacturers. The family of Italian immigrants scrimps to invest a small fortune in the plane, which becomes a family effort. Even the brothers' wives help by stitching together the canvas that will cover the wing frames. The J-7 makes aviation history as the first successful, fully enclosed, high-wing monoplane built and flown in the United States. 
Weighing 1,800 pounds, the plane measures 29 feet long with a 52-foot wingspan. It flies up to 115 miles per hour, burning through the 80-gallon fuel tank at a rate of 8 to 9 gallons per hour. To recoup on their investment, the jacuzzis explore passenger service while seeking out a contract with the U.S. Mail Service to deliver letters by air. On April 16, 1921, they successfully fly mail in the J-7 from San Francisco to Reno, Nevada. Confident in the plane's safety and reliability, postal officials are ready to ink a contract with the jacuzzis for air delivery. Before the jacuzzis agree, however, they are eager to explore passenger service to Yosemite. Confident that his family is at the forefront of the thriving aviation industry, Jacondo Jacuzzi takes part in the historic Yosemite flight, but disaster is about to change everything. It's July 14, 1921. The Jacuzzi J-7 monoplane has been sitting in a meadow sprawling before Yosemite's majestic El Capitan. Its pilot and three passengers flew into the park two days prior to explore the feasibility of passenger service to the national park. Built by the Jacuzzi brothers at their Berkeley, California manufacturing plant, the monoplane, with its radiator awkwardly protruding atop the cabin, attracts the attention of curiosity seekers and park officials. Before takeoff at 7.15 a.m., the four men stand next to the plane for photos of the historic occasion. Pilot Harold Bud Coffey stands far right. Next to him is 30-year-old plant technician Archibald Duncan McLeish. 28-year-old aviation writer John Kauk is one over. And 26-year-old aircraft designer Jacondo Jacuzzi stands closest to the new plane. Moments before takeoff, Coffey phones girlfriend Aura Jennings to tell her to watch for the plane in the skies over Modesto, about 90 miles inland from the Bay Area at around 8 a.m. The four men climb into the cabin, unaware of the fate awaiting them. As the plane's propeller whirls into a blur, a photographer takes what will become the last photograph of Coffey as he characteristically chomps on a cigar. The plane shoots along the meadow in front of El Capitan and lifts out of sight above the sheer granite walls of Yosemite Valley. They won't touch down in Modesto alive. As the plane circles Modesto, Coffee spies the airfield and prepares to set down. Within moments, something goes horribly wrong. Air witnesses on the ground claim there was an explosion, but experts say it was the left wing, made of wood struts and covered in canvas, hitting the fuselage. Speculation for the cause of the crash included several theories. One claims Coffee made an ill-timed acrobatic maneuver or hit an air pocket. Investigators suspect a catastrophic design flaw. The plane uncontrollably drops to the ground from an altitude of about 600 to 1,000 feet. The gut-wrenching sight ends with a fireball and black cloud arising from the intersection of Madison and Linden Streets, west of present-day Highway 99. That's where Jeff is headed. This is the intersection of Madison and Linden Streets. Here on the west side of Highway 99. And every account that I've read stated that the crash occurred right here in this intersection. This block here was the location of the Mays Red Park, the scene in this 1939 aerial photograph. The expansion of Highway 99 cut a piece of the park off. Now all accounts say the plane crashed straight down into the middle of Linden Street. It was reported that the bodies of the four men were crushed, and one graphically stated that Coffee was still in the pilot seat, clutching onto the controls, 
but I believe that was a total newspaper embellishment. The wing landed about a half a block away, bringing down some power lines, probably toward what is now Highway 99. It also said that there was a police force out here trying to keep people back away from the flames, away from seeing the gnarly uh, accidents, victims. One of the reports of the Oakland paper suggested that the men were all burned to death while another paper, I think of the Sacramento Union, indicated that none of them were cinched, none of the clothing was cinched. There's no historical marker designating the craft site, so maybe in the future somebody will put one out here. It was also said that the people in the crowd were trying to take pictures of the crash, but if there are any, nobody has been able to produce them for me. As I just stand here, it just must have been horrifying to see. A horrifying sight to see that day. So I'd come to the Modesto airport because a couple years ago I was here and I noticed that there were some memorabilia of Bud Coffees on display here, including the goggles that he once wore, but also had a strut, a wooden strut from the actual airplane that crashed here in Modesto. And I'm gonna go right now and see if it's still on display. So it is still here. Displayed behind the glass is not only a pair of aviator goggles worn by Bud Coffee, but also a wooden piece of the J7 wing struts. It's amazing to think that these are the actual goggles owned and worn by Coffee, now on loan by a Robert Gunn. At one time I thought they were in a crash because of the condition. And they may have been, but the J7 was an enclosed cabin, so he wouldn't have needed them, but they still could have been in the plane. Jeff drives to the Modesto Historic Cemetery. So I'm at this conglomeration of cemeteries here in Modesto. Uh, there's like three or four together. Two of the four victims from the 1921 plane crash are here. Jacondo Jacuzzi and Bud Coffee, the pilot. Now, the families of John Koch, who was 28, was buried in Southern California. Archibald Duncan McLeish was buried in San Mateo, California, not far from where they built the airplane. I'm searching this Catholic part of the cemetery, just based on the pictures that I saw of the grave on findagrave.com, uh, it's probably close to this building over here. And there he is, there's Jacondo Jacuzzi. What a fabulous headstone. So here lies Jacondo Jacuzzi. Headstone bears a badly weathered calcified photo. I have no idea what kind of technology they used to put those on back then. Age 24 years old, erected by his wife and his brothers. This little plaque here measures about five by seven says he was an Italian by birth, but I believe that he was actually born in the United States. States he was a martyr of aviation, love science, music, and pictorial art. His motto was, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, Chile Navagari Necesit Est. And in flying high over mountains and valleys, he constantly demonstrated how man is able to conquer the air. His name and work shall remain forever. That Latin phrase that was quoted here, was by the famed Roman military leader Pompey in 56 BC. The quote translates to, we have to sail, we do not have to live. Very fitting for him. He sailed, and he didn't live. Apparently Pompey yelled that to some captains of a ship that were reluctant to set sail when a great storm arose and showed his courage. So whenever I'm at a uh, gravesite, I think about the time in which the burial took place and jacuzzis were a big, loving Italian family. This entire area was just covered with people who either knew him or didn't know him. The crash was well publicized in the local newspaper here, as well as the Oakland Tribune. He left behind a young wife and a lot of brothers that uh, were very fond of him. Not only did Jacalo's death plunge the jacuzzi family into mourning, but it completely dashed any ambition that they had to be manufacturers of airplanes. In fact, uh, the father said that he wasn't gonna have any more of his sons die in airplanes. Now, older brother Raquelli, who was the one who invented the airplane, 
decided to go into other inventions and products. Rekele Jacuzzi was the brainchild of the family aircraft endeavors. He had worked as a mechanic in the garage of James McDonald, co-founder of the McDonald Douglas Aerospace Corporation. While examining planes at the 1915 Panama Pacific World's Fair in San Francisco, Rekele came up with an idea for a better propeller. He led his six brothers, now based in Berkeley, designed and built the Jacuzzi J-7, the first airplane designed with an enclosed cabin. After the crash, the Jacuzzi switched their focus to develop a variety of fans, furnaces, and wind machines designed to keep fruit orchards from freezing during winter. Tragedy struck the Jacuzzis once again when on August 24, 1937, 50-year-old Rekele died of a massive heart attack. Brother Candido took over the mantle of the company and came into prominence with the invention of the Jacuzzi Whirlpool hot tub. It's strange how one event can have such an impact on the world. If you think about it, today if we hadn't had that air crash, we probably wouldn't be in whirlpools and we'd all be flying around in jacuzzis. So now I'm off to find the grave of Bud Coffey, the pilot of that plane. There's a story that he was either showing off and doing some acrobatic stunts over Modesto because his girlfriend was on the ground. However, that has not been substantiated. There are different accounts of what actually happened. Some reports say that the wing fell off. Others say there was an explosion. But one thing's for sure, there was definitely explosion on the ground. I think the grape of Bud Coffee is over here close to this bench. In memory of Clarence Sykes. There it is, the grave of Bud Coffee. Wow, just to think that right underneath me are the crushed remains of Bud Coffee. Coffee made headlines in early July when he flew in record time from Laramie, Wyoming to San Francisco to relay photos of the celebrated New Jersey fight between Jack Dempsey and George Shaw Carpentier. He made the flight in record time of over 12 hours. Right over here is his father, Lon Coffee, who died two years after his son and his mother, Emmeline Coffee Hunt. Apparently she remarried because she's got a different last name. Emmeline often expressed fears about Bud being hurt or killed in a plane crash. And of course, Bud knew the dangers of flying, but laughed off her concerns. Lon Coffey told the Oakland Tribune newspaper after the crash that his son Bud did not want to make the Yosemite trip because he had just flown 4,000 miles in the 10 days prior and was tired, but he felt a sense of obligation and duty. So at the time of his death, Bud was living with his parents at 328 24th Street in Oakland. Lon, I understand, was an insurance agent. I find it curious to know that he died just less than two years after his son died. One can only speculate as to whether or not he was grieving so badly that he got ill. Records indicate that Lon passed away from an unspecified kidney disease at age 47. Who knows, maybe he was a drinker, I have no idea but a lot of grief for one woman to bear. This concrete marker here has an attached metal plaque which bears a beautiful tribute. It reads, in aviation, at the cost of his own life, has demonstrated what can be done by courage, faith, and perseverance. He is not dead. Life's flag is never furled. His body sleeps, but in some nobler land, his spirit marches to a new command. I understand that Emmeline Coffey had her son originally buried in another part of the cemetery over here. And when her husband passed away, and was buried here, they moved him over here. Jeff is about to unexpectedly stumble upon another historical grave. This one related to outlaw Bill Dalton. Oh my gosh. So this is the grave of Lauren Fulkerth. He was the judge that I talked about in my Bill Dalton video a couple years ago. Judge Lauren Fulkerth was the judge who was presiding over the Bill Dalton preliminary trial in 1891. There wasn't enough evidence against Bill Dalton to charge him with the robbery in the series. Later, of course, 
Chris Evans and John Sontag were the ones that were accused of doing the train robbery. Lauren Fulkert was born in Iowa in 1860 and would have been about 31 when Bill Dalton appeared in front of him. You never know what you're going to find in the cemetery when you're out looking for it. On his visit to the Modesto Museum, Jeff secures a 1920s image of Bud Coffey's first gravesite next to that of his grandparents, William and Kate Coffey. Using the photo, Jeff returns to Acacia Memorial Park on a new search for their graves. I came back by here because I wanted to find the grave of William Coffey. Turns out that Bud Coffey was originally buried in the family plot where his grandfather is buried. And judging by the fact that our picture has this monument over here and this tall obelisk over here, I would say that the Coffey grave would have to be over here. This 1921 photo shows Bud Coffey's original grave site filled with floral tributes. Bud was buried right behind the graves of his grandparents. So originally, Bud Coffey was buried right here where this gentleman, this Robert Sciotto, died in 1999, was buried there. Lon, his dad, was buried right there. And they moved him straight over here to this other section. Propped across the tombstone of William and Kate Coffey is a jacuzzi airplane propeller also covered in flowers. It's unknown if it's the same propeller from the downed aircraft. The local newspapers wrote about a huge funeral that took place for Bud Coffey several days after his death due to the air crash. It was this site right here where people gathered around on one of my trips to the museum in Modesto, I was able to hold a wooden piece of the airplane held in repository along with other Bud Coffee memorabilia. Besides the graves, it was the only tangible evidence that I found of a crash nearly a century ago. Besides being reminded that life is fleeting, this story underscores that successes are often built on failures and that progress is born of courage. We live in a fallen world where tragedy happens daily sometimes in very big ways, like it did on July 14th, 1921 in Modesto, California.